A number of years ago, I attended a conference in the States called Why Christian? The annual conference was hosted by one of my favorite current clergy women, the Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber. If you're here usually, you, I reference her all the time. And post-evangelical author Rachel Held Evans. May she rest in peace. Countless speakers, including pastors, journalists, bloggers, parents, poets, activists, and seminarians, were asked to testify to their faith as they each wrestled with the question, why Christian? Most of the speakers had moving, often pain-filled stories to share. Why, amidst all the challenges and disappointments of life today, the historic and ongoing failures of the church, and the faith-shaking traumas of their own past, why did they feel that they still had skin in the game? Why, Christian? It's a good question. And I thought it was timely to bring it up to you today since our focus throughout the season of Lent this year has been the importance, nay, the necessity for asking questions, good questions of our faith. Why Christian? As is to be expected, I did not walk away from that conference with a single coherent and conclusive answer to the question. Um, spoiler, you're not going to walk away from the service with one either. Sorry. Truthfully, I wouldn't have been satisfied if they had tried to present one. What I came away from that conference with was a reaffirmation of the truth that no two people have the exact same experience or story of faith. Why any one person chooses to be a Christian was as individual and unique as each person present. And the reason for that choice actually changes as we grow and change ourselves, or it ought to. And while I didn't walk away with a single concrete answer to the question, why Christian, what I heard was a consistent melody hidden in each of the stories, like variations on a theme, the theme of hope in the midst of struggle. As in, here is what happened when the pain, trauma, loss, and struggle, and disappointment of my life bumped up against the inexplicable love of God. I heard this refrain over and over again. Here's what it felt like when mortality's no collided with divinity's yes. Story after story of people of every color and gender and socioeconomic background proclaiming, whispering, shouting, crying, let me tell you what I saw and heard and smelled and tasted when the specific death that I thought would end me, the death of a child, the death of a relationship, the death of a dream, the death of a belief, the death of an expectation. What happened when that death encountered resurrection? Why Christian was answered not with doctrine or dogma, but with the story of what happened when each person saw the Lord. Today is Easter Sunday, which is frankly a relief, okay? Like Lent gets dark. Uh, it starts out sort of manageable and cute, like we're in the wilderness in our scriptures and our hearts and our lives, etc. But like Lent ends up taking us to Holy Week and collectively we have shed quite a few tears in this room as of late. It's been heavy. For the last two Sundays, I've caught myself at fellowship time repeating to each person, wow, do we ever need Easter? How many sleeps until Easter? We needed the relief and the release from the pain and the grief. Easter feels euphoric after all of that. We've got brass instruments and flowers for days and big choral anthems and shouts of alleluia. In praise and in prayer, we proclaim the great triumph of Christ's rising from the dead. The wilderness of Lent, that's behind us now, thank goodness. Like a valley in the shadow of death. A 
valley of dry bones. But now the tomb is empty, and a bright new day has dawned. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. But not to undo, here we go. This Jackie's on her, she's on one again. Not to undo the exhilaration of Easter Sunday. I can't help myself. I can't. I do this on Christmas Eve too. Not to undo the exhilaration of Easter Sunday, I have to be honest that as I sit with the gospel accounts of the resurrection, whether it's the one we heard in John's gospel or any of the synoptics, what I can't help but notice is something quieter and more mysterious than the full-on jubilation we experience on a Sunday morning at church. Author and theologian Frederick Buechner calls this mystery the darkness of resurrection itself that morning when it was hard to be sure what you were actually seeing. Over the past two millennia, the church has gotten real good at making a big deal out of Easter Sunday morning. And thanks to consumerism, we've been able to kick up our effect on society through the Easter Bunny and other conflating spring celebrations. But that looks nothing. That looks nothing like what we read in the Gospels. What we know from the Gospels is that the original disciples stumbled around in sort of half-light on that third day after Jesus' crucifixion, confused and afraid, rubbing their eyes and doing a double-take. Was it, was it actually an angel in that unlit tomb? The brain fog of shock and grief making it hard to kind of recall the details. Were those shadows that I saw in the corner, were they actually the grave clothes? Huh. And that quiet stranger lingering about outside, was that the gardener or someone else? I mean, he did look vaguely familiar. Who are you looking for, Mary? Or to properly translate the Aramaic, who do you want? Who do you want? Early in the morning, while it was still dark. That's where Easter happens. It begins in darkness. It begins with fear and bewilderment and pain and confusion and a profound loss of certainty. The creeds and clarifications that we cherish today, the calls and responses, the great choral hymns and anthems, the decorations and the bonnets and the chocolate treats, that all came way later. That first Easter morning looked and felt much closer to the stories I heard at that conference a few years ago and what I have heard over and over again throughout ministry, what I have heard in your stories, what I have been experiencing in my own story. Glimmers of hope in the midst of struggle. Variations on this theme. Here's what happens when ordinary people brush up against an extraordinary God. Here's what it felt like when mortality's no collided with divinity's yes. Here's what it looks like when the broken, hungry humanity encounters a bizarre and inexplicable love in the half-light of dawn. The fact is the resurrection happened in total darkness. I invite you to sit with that. And no, Connie and I did not swap notes before this. Close your eyes and focus on that truth. Because if we're honest, if we take off the rose-colored glasses for a minute, come down off our chocolate high, life seems to have more moments of darkness in it than light. Hmm? So hear the good news. The resurrection happened. It took place in total darkness, before the relief of dawn. Sometime in those pre-dawn hours of that Sunday morning, a great mystery transpired in secret. No sunlight illuminated the event. No human being actually witnessed it. And even now, 2,000 plus years later, no human narrative can contain it. It exceeds all of our attempts to pin it down, to hedge it in, to codify its features, because it is a mystery known only to God. Whatever the resurrection was and is, 
its fullness, its realization happens in holy darkness, shielded from our eyes. All we can know is that somehow in an ancient tomb on a starry night, God worked in secret to bring life out of death. Somehow from the cold darkness of a tomb, from this heart of loss and misery, God enacted salvation. In John's gospel account, Peter and the beloved disciple leave when they see the empty tomb. They check it out. Doesn't say whether one of them believes, the other one believes. Either way, they both book it. But Mary stays bewildered and bereft. Mary Magdalene sees Jesus first. Why? Because she chooses to remain in the darkness. As Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber puts it, Mary remains present to what is real, what is actually happening. She does so even when what is real feels unbearable. She does so even when she doesn't have all the answers to all of her questions. Where did they take his body? Who took his body? Why did they do that? Where is my teacher, my love, my Lord, my Jesus? So many questions, so much confusion and pain. The resurrection took place in the darkness and Mary saw Jesus first because she stayed in it. In my own life, I'm finding it increasingly true that clarity, hope, and healing, I'll say that again. This is my pastoral word for you. I'm finding it increasingly true that clarity, hope, and healing come when I am willing to linger in hard and barren places. Places where the usual platitudes fall flat, and all easy answers prove inadequate. I have found that Jesus and his resurrection come in the darkness. And sometimes it takes a long time to recognize him. He doesn't, he doesn't look the way we expect him to look. Is he, is he a gardener, a neighbor, a friend, a stranger? And he doesn't let me cling to my old ideas either. He, and then he disappears again just as soon as I grab hold of him. But he comes, he calls my name, he calls your name, and in that instant, I recognize both myself and him. Only then do I notice that the sun has crested, it's a new day, and the light pierces my heart of darkness. At the end of the day, the question that Easter asks of us is not, do we believe in the doctrine of resurrection? Kind of a boring question, frankly. Do you assent to this list of codified beliefs? The Gospels don't ask that at all. The Gospels ask, have you encountered the risen Christ? Mary encountered the risen Christ that morning because she stayed in the darkness and the confusion and the grief of that morning. She lingered in the garden, weeping, questions swirling in her head. That's when she encountered him. Even though at first she didn't even recognize him. Who really expects to find life in the midst of a graveyard? Dead things are supposed to stay dead. Most people don't go to the tomb to find life. The disciples didn't. Peter and the beloved disciples, when they saw the empty tomb, they took off. They didn't expect to find anything else there. Why linger? Clearly Jesus isn't here. We don't know where he is, but he's not here, whatever that means. We don't expect to encounter life in a lifeless place. But Mary lingers, and she weeps, and she waits for more. The responses to the empty tomb, the responses to the dark, deadened places of our lives, the responses are as unique as the people who are experiencing it. No two of us do this the same. We don't shed our baggage ahead of time. It barges in with us and shapes our perceptions and conclusions. So what matters then is encountering the risen Jesus in the particulars of our own messy lives. Whatever your mess is right now. What matters is finding in the empty tomb the hope that we need for our own struggles, losses, traumas, and disappointments, even when we don't have the answers. 
Whatever universal claims that we make as Christians must begin in the rich, fertile ground of our own hearts and our own stories. Whatever acclamations we cry out on Easter Sunday must begin with a willingness to linger in the garden, desolate, listening for the sounds of our own names spoken in love. For our testimonies to ring true, why, Christian? Why? Why do you have skin in this game? For our testimonies to ring true, they must originate in radical, intimate encounter. The question is not, why should people believe in general? But why do you believe? How has the risen Christ revealed himself to you? Who are you looking for? And church, this type of witness isn't automatic and it isn't easy. It's not something that you can say from memory. It's not a rote prayer. This requires risk. The risk of hanging on to hope when all else fails. Listen, I know how that feels right now. The risk of sitting in the dark after everyone else runs away. The risk of turning towards the one who calls our name and recognizing him for the savior he is. Often it's only in retrospect, only as I look back at the gravesides of my life that I see my salvation. This Easter, may the Christ who rose in the darkness lead us to new life, to new light, and to new hope. May we come to know him in the half-lit places, the shadowy places, the hard places. May we, like Mary, dare to linger at the tomb until he calls our names and sends us forth to share his good news with the world. And when we are asked, why Christian? May our answers be honest, humble, earned, and true. May they witness to hope and struggle, braided together. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. To God be all the glory. Amen.